Thanks everyone for coming. I know it's the last session of the afternoon and I'm probably the only thing between you and beer or something like that. So I appreciate you coming. Um, so I'm going to be talking about user research as it applies to open source projects, specifically as it applies to small and scrappy open source projects. Um, and for myself, so actually up until about a month and a half, two months ago, I was an independent user experience person. Um, I am now a co-founder and one half of a two-person startup that's building an open source publishing platform or a social CMS tool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, in a bit. But I'm going to be referencing um, some resources that we're working on that are in our GitHub account. So our GitHub is IDNO, I-D-N-O, and we've got a, se a section set up there called user research. So I'm going to be taking you through some of the stuff that we're starting to put there as part of this. So to get started, though, I want to talk about why you might want to do user research in an open source project. Um, and I was having a conversation with a friend of mine about a week or so ago. And one of the things that he said about open source in particular is that in open source, a lot of the projects tend to start out because someone's got an itch to scratch or there's an individual or a group of similar individuals who want to work on something um, that's more applicable to them. Um, but if we want to grow and build software that grows to reach a wider audience or um, to build something that has a, uh, is more accessible to a greater variety of people, we need to start bringing in feedback from them and get information from the users and the wider audience and expand beyond just building something that scratches our own itch or fills a need that we have in ourselves. Um, but one of the challenges with small open source projects is that we're actually up against companies like this. So you might not think that your project or the product that you're working on has any kind of direct competition with big companies like this. But companies like this um, are have the resources and the budget and the scope to do lots of user research and testing. And these are also tools and products and companies that your users are familiar with. And so for better or worse, they've become accustomed to these experiences, these interactions. Um, and even if you don't necessarily consider yourself to be a competitor of someone in this bigger space, you are, in a sense, competing with the, the habits and the interactions and the experiences that people have grown accustomed to and gotten used to dealing with in other bigger companies that do have the resources and the scope to do a lot of extensive user research and testing. And you can think about a company like Twitter, for instance, who has a wide audience of users. And if they want to test something, they can release a new feature to a small subset of their users and test that new feature or product before it ever reaches their entire, their entire audience. And if they want to gather some specific information around a certain topic, they can segment it and look at people who have never used Twitter before. They can look at people who have just started using Twitter in the last few months. They can look at people who've been using Twitter for years now, so they have these great segmentation capabilities. They can look at data analyt and analytics around their entire population and see that, for instance, maybe in a certain country, um, people are doing something completely different from everyone else, and they have the resources to put together a team and send them there to go to that country and talk to those people and find out what's going on. Um, whereas, if you're a smaller, scrappy, open source project, you don't necessarily have these kinds of resources, this kind of scope um, to do things like these companies. However, I don't want that to discourage anyone from getting started with user research. So my goal is to provide you with the tools to get started doing something that's quick and easy and cheap that you can start bringing into the work that you're already doing with your project, no matter how big or small it is. And I know that it can be hard to get started with user research, especially if you've never done it before or you don't have any tools to use or any place to turn to um, as a reference or an example. So that's why I wanted to put together some resources and references for people to use um, to make that step easier. And so that you have something um, to start with when you want to get going with user research. So as I mentioned, we set up um, a user research section on our company, GitHub. Um, 
one of the things that we want to do just for ourselves is start to use the templates that we've been using for our own user research and just maintain it someplace so that we can continue to reference it for stuff. But we also want to make it available so that as our open source community grows, other people can access those templates and resources and build off of them. And we also want to make it available so that people with other communities and completely different projects can access the resources and help us grow our resources um, and help develop the information that's there. So please, I would love to get your feedback um, during the presentation, afterwards, whenever, on things that you would like to see, um, information you'd like to have, resources, templates, questions that you have, so that we can continue to evolve and develop um, this collection that we're starting on our GitHub space. So a little bit about our company. We are a two-person team. It's myself and Ben Wordmuller. Um, as I said, we are very new. Um, ben started working on code for Known, the project, um, just over a year ago. And we've been working on it as very much a side project, a hobby thing, for the last year in our spare time, um, whenever there was an opportunity. And about eight weeks ago, we officially became a company and jumped in and started doing it full time. Um, and so we quit our jobs, and we are now working on Known. And the thing that made that possible is that we were accepted into Matter, which is an accelerator in San Francisco that focuses on um, Startups that change media for good is one of their taglines. So they're backed by the Knight Foundation and KQED and PRX. And we are one of six companies that's working in the Matter Accelerator over the course of the summer. Um, we're the youngest company. So we're the only company that became a company for the program. Everyone else had already been at it for at least a year. And we're also the smallest. So we are a team of two only. Um, we do have an open source community, but the community is also small. We're not the only open source community or company in the program, but the program is not specifically for open source um, companies. So this has been a really interesting opportunity for us. Um, and for Matter, one of their foundations is design thinking, which has been made popular by organizations like IDEO and the Stanford D School. So the way they structure the program is very much rooted in design thinking. And as part of that, everyone went through a week of design thinking boot camp to kick things off and get started working um, on our companies as part of the program. And one of the areas, um, one of the components that they have as part of the design thinking and the structure of the MATTER program is sort of this three-prong area of focus around desirability, feasibility, and viability, where desirability um, covers things like empathy and accessibility and usability and meeting users' needs. And then feasibility is much more on the technology side of things. So can you actually build the thing based on the technology that exists and your knowledge of the technology? And then viability um, is much more on the can you create a business around it? Can you create something sustainable? In the case of open source communities that aren't necessarily businesses, can you create a sustainable community around the project or the product that you're working on? And then they believe that somewhere in between these three areas, there's that sweet spot, and that's where the perfect company lies when you've taken all these aspects into consideration. And I would say that for most open source projects, especially when they're just getting started, a lot of the emphasis is really on the feasibility, the technology side of things. Like, can you build something? Do you know how to build it with the technology and the tools available? Like, are you capable of making it? Um, and there's less emphasis on viability, the sustainability and business side of things, and less emphasis on desirability and meeting users' needs. So this and user research is very much focused on the desirability aspect and bringing some of that um, empathy and consideration for the user's needs into the project that you're working on. So to get started with user research, when should you start testing with your project? So the best thing I've heard for open source recently is that when your open source project turns into a product, it's probably a good time to consider testing. So when your mindset changes from, this is just a project that I'm doing for myself or for a small group of people because we're kind of into it, to, oh, this is a product that we're building that other people outside of me or outside of our little group might be using, that's when you should start to consider user testing and where you can get feedback from users and how you can start to bring that kind of information in. Some other things you might think about, um, you should start user testing 
um, when you want someone else to use it, when, you're, when you realize that you're building based on assumptions that you have, um, or when you don't know the answer to something, but you're building anyway, and if nothing else, just test early and test often. And then what should you test when you realize that you're gonna start testing? So I like to step back and think about the questions that you want answered. So think about what kind of questions you want whatever test you're doing to answer and then think about what kind of information you want um, those questions to provide. What sorts of information, what types of resources, what types of things are you looking to get out of it? And then use that to figure out what kind of tests, what sort of tools are gonna provide the sorts of information to the questions that you want answered. There's a lot of different types of research out there. And I'm not gonna cover all of them today, but feel free to talk to me afterwards if you'd like to learn more about something. Um, but the three that I wanna talk about today, that the three that we've been most focused on with known are surveys and interviews and usability testing. So that's what I'm gonna cover today. And I'm starting with surveys and working up to usability testing, sort of going from most hands-off in a way to more hands-on. So surveys, when to use surveys. So I would say you might want to start consider using a survey um, when you wanna measure changes over time. So if you wanna benchmark something like customer satisfaction over time. Um, you can use surveys when you want to quantify characteristics of your users or customers or the people that you hope to use the thing that you're building. Um, you can use surveys if you wanna measure things like people's attitudes and intents. Um, either in specific areas or around the thing that you're building. Um, and you can also use surveys when you want to measure product usage or activity. So we set up um, sort of an overview page on GitHub for surveys, um, just to give people a starter reference some, and some high level things that I'll pull out for you right now. Thinking about participants, it's a little harder for surveys to say like, oh, you should get responses from this number of people. Um, because of who you want to get the responses back from. So I would say you're aiming for a significant number of responses, but that might vary based on the population that you're looking at. So if you are looking to gather information from a group of users and there's only 200 of them, the number of responses that you're looking for is gonna be very different than if you're doing research on every single middle-aged American. But in general, you want a significant number of responses for the size of the population that you're looking at. Um, there's several different types of questions that you could include in the surveys. In a little bit, I'll pull up, we have some sort of starter template questions that we put up on GitHub to get people um, going there, but you can do open-ended questions, you could do multiple choice questions, rating scales, um, select from a list of things. So you've got a couple different options. Um, I would say when you're crafting a survey, one of the things that you definitely wanna do after you've got a draft going is to give it to a few friends or colleagues first to read through to get some feedback before you send it out to people. Um, they can help you if you've written something that sounds a little bit weird and you need to tweak your language or maybe you've forgotten um, some responses or some choices that should be answers there. So definitely take the opportunity to share it with a few people first to get some feedback before you send it out to people. Um, and another tip in general surveys is to keep it shorter rather than longer. People in general don't really like going through and filling out lots of pages of surveys, especially online. So when in doubt, err towards the shorter side of things. So if you're just getting started with surveys and you want some quick and easy tools to turn to or to start exploring, these are a couple options. Um, I have used all of them except, unfortunately, for Lime Survey, which is the open source option, but I do know people who have used Lime Survey um, before. Um, for the kind of stuff that we're doing, free or low cost is usually pretty important. We don't have much of a budget for this sort of thing. Um, so if I had to choose one or two that I tend to lean towards, it's usually right now Google Forms or SurveyMonkey. Google's pretty straightforward, it's easy, it's very basic, it's free. Um, SurveyMonkey has a free option, but then you can also pay for more features and things. It is not as easy and straightforward, but it has um, more refined tools, so depending on what you're trying to get out of the survey, it might be a better choice. Um, but definitely, 
take a, the chance to play around and take a look at a couple of these, and depending on what your needs are, one of them might be a better choice for you than others. Okay, I mentioned some starter questions that you can use as a template. So we tried to throw together on GitHub um, just some basic things that you could customize and fill in the blank to use for whatever it is you're asking about, your product, your customer base, et cetera. So please feel free to take these and customize them for your own needs. But we've tried to include a mix of some open-ended um, questions that you can use, some things that um, would have a list of choices, such as like, what blogging tools do you use? And then you provide a list of different blogging options, um, some rating scale things, so things like how satisfied are you with your experience with this project? And you could have a rating that went from very dissatisfied to very satisfied. Um, so some different choices there that you can take and customize and build off of um, when you're setting up your survey. And finally, finding participants for your survey is always good. Your survey is very little if it has no responses. So it depends a bit on what type of people you're trying to get responses back from. If you're looking for responses from people who already use your product or your tool, um, maybe you have something like a project email list or a company email list or a list of customers that you could send out to. If not, um, but you know you're looking for a certain type of person, there might be things like listservs and mailing lists and special interest groups where the people um, in general might represent the type of people that you're going after. There's options like Craigslist. If you're going for a more general audience type person, um, there's options like intercept surveys or pop-ups on your website. If you think you have enough traffic coming to your site that matches what you're looking for, you might be able to grab people off of your website. Um, and then you can do things like share it out to your social networks, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, to get start to spread the word around and get a link for the survey out to people. So for known, so far we've done one semi-official survey um, since getting started this summer. We wanted to collect some just basic information on amateur bloggers and content creators. So we put together a little survey to gather more details on the types of tools that people were using for blogging, the types of social networks that people were um, using, some information on whether they revealed their identity on their blog or if it was anonymous, um, and then also what sort of the most important tool for them was. Um, some of the th responses that we got back were things that we expected, like the tools for blogging, WordPress, Blogger, Tumblr were the big ones. We were sort of expecting that. Um, we had about 50 responses. That's smaller than I would have liked, but we did this very quickly, so we only did it for a few days, and we just needed some details fairly quickly to gather some information and move on. One of the biggest findings from the information that we collected here was on the the most important tool for the people um, when they were blogging, I would have expected it was something like a blogging platform. And actually, the vast majority of people said the most important tool for blogging for them was Facebook. And following up with people later, Facebook was the most important tool because that's where their audience of readers was. So people are not coming to these people's websites or their blogs to read the content there. They are living on Facebook and to a lesser extent, other social networks, but people listed Facebook as the most important. So they're spending a lot of time sharing out the content that they're putting on their website to Facebook and their other social networks to get the readership and the audience and the comments there. And that was kind of a, a key thing for us because we're working on audience and readership and designing things for social interaction within the platform. So for interviews, when to use interviews with people. Um, they're great for needs finding, which is a lot of what we've been doing for Known. Um, interviews are also great if you're doing it in person and you want to see the person in their environment, either at home or at work, or doing something specific as it applies to whatever you're, you're studying and trying to gather information on. Um, they're also a good way to assess the tools and workflows um, of people. And they're a good way to gather more in-depth information on people's attitudes and desires and experiences. So for interviews, we again set up, we've got an overview page here on GitHub with some general um, steps for getting started and timelines um, and some 
key highlights that I'll share with you right now. If you're thinking about participants here and you're just trying to do some fast interview sessions, I would say to aim for between five to eight people. Um, if you can, somewhere in that range. And perhaps try and schedule one or two more than you think you actually need because people are humans and scheduling problems come up and they don't always show up or call in when you need them. So maybe err on the side of more rather than less. Um, you might want to provide an incentive. It depends a bit on who you're talking to, what the motivation is, and sort of the context. But I, we've got a little bit of information on incentives listed here um, on the GitHub page. Um, you might be able to pull off an interview session cycle in a week, um, depending on what other things you have on your plate. So for us, I think all of the interview sort of suites that we've done have gone from start to finish in a matter of six, four to six days. So you can pull this sort of thing together fairly quickly if you need to gather information pretty quickly. Um, some different steps that you want to consider when you're getting ready to set these up. Things like creating a screener to send out to people to gather details from people um, so you can get their contact information and um, follow up with them or eliminate people that don't really match the type of people that you're looking to talk to. Um, be able to send it around to a variety of people. So again, you need a target audience to send something to. Um, you need the time to prepare the questions or general ideas around questions that you want to ask people. Um, take the time to confirm the scheduling with the interview people that you'd like to talk to and make sure that's squared away. And then some time to choose the recording software that you might want to use for the interview. So. One of the things about the interviews that we like to have available is the option to record the session. It's a lot easier for note taking um, to go back later and review it and make sure you got the details right. And if you're doing a couple of these in an afternoon, um, it's also pretty easy to get details confused between people. So it's handy to be able to go back and just check the recording if you need to pull out um, more detailed information. So if you're just getting started and you want some options to explore that are on the free, cheap, or scrappier side of things, these are all um, things that we've played around with. Um, they're not all perfect. I don't think a peer.in, and I'm not sure about Skype, I don't think they do recording. So if you chose those, you might have to layer on another recording option. But all of these would allow you to have a conversation with someone via their phone or a web conference. Um, so for me, the two that I sort of lean to right now are Google Hangouts and join.me. Google, because a lot of people have it, it's easy. You can call from your computer. You can do a video conference, but you can also call someone if they're on their cell phone so they don't have to be using their computer. Join.me um, is handy because they have international numbers. And so we've also been talking to people in other countries. Um, and this gives them a way to call in. And we don't have to worry about dealing with the right number for whatever country they're in and making sure it's toll free or not, or how much is this going to cost, and that sort of thing. So um, it joined at me is kind of handy for the international numbers. And it also has video conferencing and screen sharing and recording and that sort of stuff as well. So right now, I'm, those are sort of the options that we've been leaning towards. Um, so some of the resources that we've put together as templates for interviews that you might want to grab and use if you are trying to get this set up. We've got a template for a survey screener, so gathering some basic information from people to get their contact details and to get a little information about them so you can decide if they're worth following up and trying to get scheduled for an interview. Um, a template for a confirmation email if you're sending them information to get them scheduled and providing them with their date and time and information on the web link or the phone number that you're going to use. A sample script for the moderator, the person conducting the interview, so that you have something to start off of. Um, and go from there. Um, and then some started questions, because it can be hard to figure out what are you going to ask these people. Um, so we've got some basic adaptable starter questions that you can customize to fit whatever it is you're trying to gather from people. Um, in general, open-ended questions are better. Um, it's not so great to ask questions that can be answered with just a yes or no. You want something that would spark a conversation and get the person talking. Um, so in the document with those sample questions there in GitHub, there's some good sort of 
broad general things to get people started talking and then some more sort of focused or follow-up questions. And then I like to finish up with sort of a wrap-up finalizing question as well. So we've got, we started to build out a list of very basic template questions that you can adapt for your own uses. So again, finding participants for interviews is similar to finding participants for surveys. It depends a bit on who you want to talk to. So you might, again, send out a message to your existing um, customer list or email list if you have one. Um, you might try and check out meetups or clubs or groups that are related to the type of people that you're trying to reach out to. Craigslist is a possibility depending on the sort of person that you're looking for. Um, word of mouth is also a possibility. Sharing via your social channels is also a possibility if you're trying to reach out and find people who might be available for an interview. And so our experiences so far, we um, actually started doing interviews with people before we became a company, back when we, it was still like a side project hubby. Um, and this is something we talked about and planned to build into the project, whether or not it was a company, for a long time. So I think we did our first sort of official set of interviews at the end of February or the beginning of March. And that was with people who were already um, on the email list for the project, who had already shown interest in the project, but who weren't using um, the tools they hadn't downloaded them off of GitHub or anything like that. So we followed up with a handful of people. And that was actually really great. Um, we wanted to find out things like what sorts of tools and technologies they used, what their interest was, what they were currently using for their website, if they had one, things related to their server or their hosting environments. One of the big takeaways that actually changed some of the work that we did based on this interview session that we did with people was that um, a number of the people weren't able to download our project and use it off GitHub because the database was in MongoDB. And that was one of the choices that Ben had just made when he started working on it because he was exploring that and it worked for him. But what we found was that it wasn't accessible enough for the widest variety of people. And we really needed something that was had the same level of accessibility like WordPress, a LAMP stack, PHP, and MySQL. And most of the people that we talked to were interested in the project, but hadn't been able to get it set up and running on whatever web space they had available to them because of this. And so getting that transferred over from Mongo to MySQL um, was a big change that happened. And we did it specifically because of the responses that we got from these interviews. And as soon as that change happened, a lot of people, a lot more people started downloading and people started contacting us saying, hey, we were interested in your project, but we haven't been able to do anything with it. Thanks for using MySQL. And that's actually sparked more conversations and partnerships with people as soon as that change happens. Almost the next day, we started getting messages from people saying, oh, great, I can use your thing. I just installed it and got it up and running on my shared host. It's awesome. Like, Let's talk more about this. So I don't think that's something that we would have figured out unless we had started talking to these people. Because it's not something that I ever would have thought of. And ironically, I was never able to get the software set up and running on my shared host. It was running on Ben's server because I couldn't get MongoDB to work. But it didn't occur to me that this was sort of a friction point for people. Um, we also did a set of interviews with just sort of generic amateur blogger, content creator, photographer type people to figure out more about the platforms that they were using, the tools that they were using with social media to di dive into this whole like Facebook is maybe your most important blogging tool thing um, and to get more information around workflows and how they like to publish stuff from their platform. and. Those conversations have really directed us in more features that we're planning on adding over the course of the summer that relate more towards workflow and publishing, and also how can we build in a greater sense of readership and audience and community into the platform. So that's really steered us in um, a direction to consider things more related to social and audience and readership, and how do you, how do you bridge and bring that into the platform. Um, and then we also started doing a set of interviews with PR people and social media people to get more feedback from people who create content for other organizations online as well and find out more about their workflows and their processes if they're working for a company um, and doing this kind of work. So usability tests as the last option. 
So when to use usability tests? I would say as soon as you have some sort of prototype or product that you can start putting in front of people and getting in their hands, that's a great time to get started. Um, usability studies are great if you want to test different types of user flows, if you're looking to find out what frustrations and problems people might be running into, if you want to check things like navigation, um, interactions within the product or the platform, or if you want to start measuring different um, successes with tasks. So again, we have a general overview page set up on usability testing in the GitHub uh, folder. Like interviews, I would say if you're doing this type of quick set of usability tests, I would tend to aim for between five and eight people if you can get them, maybe all scheduled on one day or one afternoon or maybe two different afternoons depending on your scheduling. Um, again, schedule one or two more than you might need because people's schedules don't always work out perfectly. Um, maybe offer an incentive based depending on, a bit on sort of who they are and what you're doing and what the motivation might be for them working with you. Um, and then again, having a way to either do screen sharing if you're doing it remotely with someone online or have a way to do a screen capture recording if they're in person with you using like your test computer or device or something like that so that you're able to capture the screen and the conversation as it's going during the test. Um, you might be able to get the scheduled and set up and running within from start to finish within one week or two weeks, depending on what else you have on your plate and how much time you have. Um, and I should also say that both for the usability studies and for the interviews, um, it works really good to have at least two people. It's very hard to be one person and be responsible for asking the questions or directing the task, reading the script, sort of um, keeping track of everything that's going on and taking notes. That gets very tiring and it's very hard to focus on what the person's saying or doing and observing and listening to them and continuing the conversation while also frantically writing down notes. So it's great if you've got at least two people. So that works out really well for Ben and I. That means we're both in the room for every single session. Um, Usually he's taking notes and then I'm moderating or asking the questions. Um, and in general, if you can get the other people in the room or online remotely who might be responsible for designing and building the thing that you're testing, that's great. For us, it's really just the two of us. Um, but if you've got other people, if you can get them in the same space or get them in remotely or at least have that recording that you can share with your other team members or have that as a reference, um, it's really great for them to be able to hear that conversation or to see that usability study. So if you're just getting started and you are looking for some software, for desktop, um, these are all options. Some of them are for remote screen sharing and capturing, and some of them are in person capturing the interactions on your test screen. So I use a Mac, um, so if I'm doing in person stuff, I tend to lean towards Silverback which lets me get the software up and running on my computer. The person can come in and use my computer and that will record the whole session on the screen and the audio conversation as well. Um, if it's a remote session, I'm still kind of leaning towards join me right now for this sort of thing. Um, you can do a screen share so you can see the other person's screen, um, hear them talking and re record that whole interaction. For mobile, it's a little bit trickier. There's not as many great recording options in this space. Um, there are some apps that let you record on Android, but I don't know what they are. So if you've used any, definitely I'd love to hear what you've used in your feedback. Magitest used to have an Android and iOS option, but they dropped Android because it was so buggy. I actually don't 100% recommend Magitest. We tried to use it about a year ago with a different project for iOS, and it was too buggy to use at all. Um, but it's been a year, so maybe uh, if you want to explore that option, it's a possibility you can tap into their SDK for um, recording interactions in the app. Um, UX Recorder might work for us. It's iOS only, and it's only for websites, which actually works for us because our product is a responsive site. If you're looking at apps, it's not going to work, um, but it will record the screen capture um, of someone interacting with a website on an iOS device. There's also the camera slays. So I'll show you an image in a second, but you can 
do it yourself and rig up a camera that will record the device and the hand gestures as someone's going through. And then there's some different possibilities with mirroring whatever mobile device um, to a desktop computer and then recording that from the desktop computer. So when I mean like crazy DIY scrappy for this, like you don't have to be fancy. This is the crazy camera slay that I made um, to start to capture stuff from an iPad. So it doesn't have to be fancy. This is a webcam taped to a wire that's clipped to an iPad that goes into a computer and certainly not nice looking, but it works to capture the gestures and the screen on the device. So you can be cheap and scrappy and you can still gather information that way. Um, some other tools for the moderator for both interviewing and usability sessions in general, you wanna be recording as much as possible. So if you don't have any other way to do it, some sort of audio recorder to capture the conversation, um, if nothing else, a camera, to take pictures. I've done uh, mobile usability studies before where there was no way to capture it um, with one of these recording platforms. So I had a recorder that got the conversation and then every time something interesting happened, I stopped and took a picture with the camera. So you do what you have to do for this sort of thing. Um, record notes, sticky notes. This other thing here is my LiveScribe pen. So this will actually record audio um, and the notes that I'm writing down. So it won't work if you wanna capture um, the interactions on a screen. But if you do need a way to get, grab audio, it will grab the audio and it will grab the notes if, you take, if you're writing notes in the LiveScribe notebook. So it's really great for interviews. So for usability testing in the folder, we've got a couple different templates set up for people to use. Um, there's a template for a confirmation email when you're getting someone scheduled and confirmed to come in for a test or to do a remote test. There's a consent form, which is really great to have, especially because you want to do things like um, record the session if they consent to that. Um, and then a sample moderator script that you can take and build off of and add in tasks. So you have a starting point to figure out sort of what to say to get the whole process up and running and to get the usability session started. And then there's some information in there about things that you might want to consider for tasks. And it can be as simple as, hey, we have this product, here's the website. Do you mind if we stand here and watch as you sign up for an account and take a look and play around with it? I mean, that's a very basic thing to do, but that's something that we're gonna be doing a lot of just to get a feel for what people do and stumbling blocks that they have as they get set up and start to use the, the application. So finding participants again for usability tests, if you have it and you're looking for existing people who already have used your product or are already interested in your product, having some sort of um, customer email list is handy. Um, hackathons and conferences and events like this are also great, especially um, if you're looking for a certain type of person that might fit a certain type of conference or event. You can pull people aside, schedule them in quick little sessions. Um, Craigslist and TaskRabbit are places that people also go to recruit for usability participants. Places where people gather in common spaces like hostels and co-working spaces and college quads might be great places to grab people in, especially depending on what type of people you're looking for. If it's something education related, maybe grab some students in a quad. Um, we're actually, one of the guys who's interested in using our platform was the original founder of Hostels.com and he wants a group social publishing space for a hostel that he still has. And he also runs a co-working space. And he actually has a hostel in San Francisco. So we're planning on going and sitting in the common room of the hostel and as different people come in, getting them set up with an account and finding out what that experience is like for them. And that's a great way for us to get feedback from a whole wide variety of different people coming into the hostel. Um, and then again, there's some social sharing options you can send out to your various networks to get um, the word spread around. So for us, we actually haven't done any usability, official sort of usability testing yet. Um, we've been getting sort of alpha accounts set up for a handful of people um, in very closed environments. We had planned on doing a lot more usability testing and actually had scheduled out a variety of different things. And just because of the course of the program that we're in, it hasn't happened, but we're very much at the beginning of July. We have to start doing a lot of usability testing with people. And a lot of it, first and foremost, is gonna come down to giving people an account and seeing what it's like for them to sign up and get set up and squared away. Um, some of the other things that we wanna look at are 
posting from the different types of content. We have things like blog posts, images, audio, and video. video. And we also have people posting in different environments because it's responsive, so the experience could be different on a mobile device versus a desktop device, so we want to look at that. Um, we want to dive more into the experience of getting up and running when the service is hosted by us versus people who are doing it themselves and hosting it in their own space, whatever that might be like. Um, and then we're doing a lot with comments and social interactions as part of the publishing platform, so we have a lot of things we're trying to figure out there with people. Um, and then browser plugins. Within the community that we have, people have submitted a variety of different types of bookmarklets and plugins, and some of them do overlapping things, and some of them are kind of wonky. And so we're trying to figure out how we either pull all that together and have just one bookmarklet type thing, or someone wants like a different browser plugin for all of our different content types. I'm not sure that's the right direction to go, but we need to look at sort of the plugins that people have been writing for us and find out how people are using these different bookmarklets in their browsers um, to figure out what we're going to do there. So one of the advantages to being a tiny little startup with um, not a lot of people involved is you don't have to write a whole bunch of big reports and charts and graphs and things like that. So for us, analyzing the results from these different types of studies, um, things that we like to do after the sessions are done, sit down quickly and pull out like key things that um, struck us or highlights or sticking points or things that we really noticed. And then take the information that we've gathered and start to cluster some of the main ideas that we saw to see where trends and themes and high level concepts are emerging across people. And use that information to sort of step back and say, hey, we actually had a couple different people who ran into this problem or who all said this a similar thing or look at things that are very actionable that came up across a variety of different people and say, you know what, this was mentioned by a whole bunch of different people and that's something that we can fix right away. Or this is a greater trend that a bunch of people sort of talked about. We're not really sure what to do about it, but we need to get it like on the whiteboard to think about and talk about. So this is sort of how we analyze the information that we've been collecting from the studies. So to wrap up, I want to reiterate that my goal here is to give you tools that are quick and easy and cheap to use for user testing so that you can jump in and get started. Um, and you should feel empowered to carry out user testing, even if you're a small team like us with just two people. Um, and again, I want to say, so the resources that we started putting up in GitHub, we're doing that, one, because we want a reference for ourselves, but two, because as our community grows, we want people to take the resources and make them their own and continue to do user testing um, sort of within the greater project. But we also want other projects and other communities to take the resources and use them for their work. And so we would really love feedback from people on what sorts of templates they're looking for, what kind of information they're looking for, what kind of questions you have, so that we can evolve the collection that we're creating and make sure we get lots of valuable um, templates and resources here for people to use. So thank you, and I would love to answer questions or get feedback from you on what we could include here. So um, one thing I was curious about, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is something you want to address now or something you put it to the GitHub repository, but I'm sort of curious how, how these recommendations differ for here's this giant thing we already have built and how can we improve it versus the we're making it. So um, I think to some extent, if you've never done user research um, and you're just getting started, it doesn't really matter if you're a tiny project or a large project because you've still got things that you're working on. Um, you've, you're still developing new features. Um, the product, the community is evolving. There's always uh, opportunity to jump in and start learning things. Um, so one of the other companies in our accelerator class, they're not open source, but they recently, they've been a company, I think, since 2012. So they've been going for a while, but they recently said, hey, we absolutely like, we're not sure if we're doing this whole thing, right? They're trying to work out like a Facebook thing, interaction, They're like, we don't know, we want to send out a survey to 10,000 people and just find out what people do on Facebook. And I'm like, one, where are you going to get 10,000 people? And two, what are you trying to accomplish there? Um, 
So I think it's still valid to go through the process and take a step back and say, OK, so we have these questions. The thing is, no matter what size of a company or project you are, there's always going to be questions that you have as you go. So um, it's sort of how many people are involved might change. Um, the audience might change um, based on the size of your project, the size of your user base. Um, but these same types of tools and methods could be applied to very large companies with an established product and an established user base. And quite often, actually, a lot of not just open source, but companies in general don't do any of this work and become large companies and have problems because of it. Yeah. And those are the most valuable things that I find out. And a lot of people who are doing testing don't realize that it's okay to aim your research at a certain set of questions and find out some stuff you didn't know to ask about. That's really great data. It might be the most important data you're going to get. And sometimes you need to kind of steer into that. So in the middle of your testing uh, week, you might discover that uh, you really need to be having a conversation yeah. Kind of rearrange what you're doing in order to find out more about that really important thing. So I think that um, it's important to realize that quality of testing is not the same as quantitative testing, and it's not so, uh, it doesn't have to be as rigid and scientific and controlled. It's a lot better to uh, find those things that you weren't looking for. Yeah. For us, something like the MongoDB was a huge one that changed a lot of stuff. Um, on a different level, finding out more about the importance of Facebook and sharing on social networks is not something that we can immediately like flip a switch and make a change and make a difference. But that's more of a general theme that we want to explore now and gather more information on and try a bunch of different possibilities. Um, I should say one other thing that we haven't done yet that we've been talking about and that we're going to do um, soon is in addition to these sorts of templates and resources on GitHub, we want to make information about the studies that we're doing available on GitHub as well. And so I think we've been talking about what to do from like a anonymity standpoint and that sort of thing. And I think what we're going to do to start is sort of put our summary of what we did um, publicly on GitHub so that we can reference and sort of say like, hey, these were our kind of high level findings and things that we discovered. So when we make this change over here, it's because this is what we heard. So for instance, with the MongoDB thing, if people say, I don't understand why you just added MySQL, we can go back and say, hey, we did this set of interviews over here. This is what we were looking for. Here's some of the feedback we got. These people said that they couldn't use the platform because of Mongo, but they could if it was MySQL. So this is why we've made the change. So that's something that doesn't live on GitHub right now, but we're trying to figure out the best way to kind of put a summary of all the research that we do and make it available for people as well to reference. Yeah, Rocket Surgery and Don't Make Me Think, great, from uh, Steve Krug. Great books to jump in. Very quick, easy reads also. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you.